I'm going to tell you about the character I'm about to interview or talk to or figure out. Her name is um, Lena, and um, this is what she wrote about herself. We are all on our way to becoming something else, are we not? This is Barber, one name, the spirit leader of the movement called STEP. This is Barbara who, Lena, a drifting, wounded woman, you can't always see wounds. Sometimes they are little engines compelling a body from one city to another, one lover to another, endlessly. Until a place and a people heal the wound and stop wandering. This is Barbara, who was Lena, a person who belongs to something, a person becoming a self. Please welcome Lena. So, <laughs> I'm going to move back a little here and get a little comfy. Um, I, um, I know you're, you were once Lena, and you're becoming Barber, and your identity is evolving and becoming more powerful. And now it incorporates some of the aspects of your father. Um, so, let's discuss your evolving, and let's discuss... Let's discuss the transition and that you're becoming a little more like your father, Ava, who has now passed away. But let's talk about him. You want to talk about my father? Uh, well, so you said passed away, but he wasn't passed away. He was murdered. Uh, and that's, that's fine. I think he always knew he was going to be murdered. He was a powerful man. But you know, he didn't become powerful, he just was powerful. So I don't know this thing about how I'm becoming powerful. I think I'm just becoming myself. Maybe well, becoming my father, I don't, I don't know. Well, don't you think you were always both your, you were, you were Lena, but you were also Barber and Barber, they were both parts of yourself? Yeah, sure. They're, there. I mean, I don't think Lena knew anything about Barbara for a long time. I wonder if my father was alive, if he would have recognized Barbara as something he knew or somebody he made. Well, you left your mother um, and you sort of, you've individuated yourself, as we would say in psychology, by drifting and staying and various places around, and now you found yourself in STEP, a movement that seems to um, fit you. You feel at home in this movement, and you feel accepted. Can you talk about the movement a little bit and what it's like to live in a communal existence with all these people? Um, and how you work together, and how that somehow may in some way link you to those things you were doing for your father when he was a kind of rebel rouser? Hmm. My father was the kind of man who, you know, I mean, we're from this little town in the south, Absalom, you know this town, and it's not even a town, it's just some streets. And we are, we were, was, my mother's still there, you know. It's an all-black town, defended town, in a time when black people didn't defend themselves very much or weren't allowed to in any case. You know, it's a town where there's one way in and there's one way out, and we could see who was coming and who was going, and we knew who they were. And the town was united in its mission to defend itself and not take too much shit. And my father was the... I don't know, kind of de facto leader. You know, he didn't, he didn't want to be a leader. He, he just kind of was. But <laughs> it's kind of funny because it made him have to be absent all the time because he was always getting in trouble, so he's always going to have to hide in the woods. And what was he hiding in the woods? White folks. White folks. He, he, he punched this guy in the face once, this white guy. You know, I mean, in 1952, you didn't punch white people in the face. And so he punched this white guy in the face because he didn't want to pay him what he owed him for some furniture that he made. And then there was all this shit about them getting up a posse and riding on the town, which is kind of stupid because we could see them coming from miles away. So there they came. 
And all the lights went out in Absalom. And my father went into the woods. He was gone in the woods for weeks and weeks that time. You know, if you, if you knew when to look on a kind of no moon night, you would see him maybe kind of stealthy coming out of the woods. We used to leave stuff for him, you know, packets of food or a sharpened buck knife or shotgun shells, whatever it was. Were you the one who left everything? Yeah, a lot of times I was, because I was, I was a kid, I was little. Nobody noticed me much. So I don't know, I guess I thought kind of that my father was a loner in a town of people that were always together. And I thought I was a loner. I just thought I didn't fit anywhere and I couldn't know anybody and nobody could ever know me. I mean, I mean, I had a lot of sex, but that didn't really matter. You know, just, just people and places on and on. And I thought that was better. I really did, I thought that was, I thought that was better. Because my mother, you know, she thinks she kind of owns the town. After they murdered my father, she kind of thinks she's some kind of, I don't know, like the old lady sitting on the rocking chair can tell you all the stories. But isn't the town the place she belongs now? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, she decided. Weren't you now looking for a place to belong? I guess so. But I didn't know that. I didn't think I was looking for anywhere to belong. I didn't think I really wanted to belong anywhere. I thought I just should be by myself. And then I discovered that maybe what I really wanted was to be in love. But not like in love with somebody, but with something or some group of people or How some place to be. How did you get involved be. with STEP? Well, you know, for years, all this, I left home in the early 60s, I left Absalom and I kind of drifted around, went to college and dropped out of college and went to college and dropped out of college and went to college and dropped out of college. Anyway, so that all happened. And I went to a lot of different towns and there were a lot of different people doing civil rights stuff. And I thought it was interesting, you know, not because I thought, I mean, I thought it was important, you know, but everybody had all these positions, you know, and my thought, my father's position was that he'd punch you in the fucking face, which seemed to me to be the best kind of position. But other people didn't have that position, so I don't know. It just seemed interesting in a way, not politically kind of, but that people were so united in purpose. And I guess I wanted to feel kind of close to that, even though I didn't really think that their way of being united in purpose was my way of being united in purpose. I mean, I don't mean to say they didn't do a lot of good. Of course they did. But... I just didn't feel like my way ever. And then it all was over, you know? I mean, here we are, it's, it's 1985, right? And it's all over, it's Reagan and all this kind of shit. It's all over. What's all over? All of it, the fervor, the movements, the progress, the, the change, the hope. They killed everybody, you know? I mean, I could do the list, Malcolm and Martin and on and on. They killed everybody, and now it's all over. And everybody's kind of hopeless, and everybody's kind of drifting, and everybody's kind of lost, and Reagan is the fucking president. So, but STEP. So I how, don't know. Did, how did you become a member of STEP? How did you find STEP? How did they find you? They sent a guy. They, they have these, uh, you know, there's still these meetings, you know, like CORE and the Panthers, and I still go to the meetings, or I still went to the meetings, because, I don't know, I still wanted to feel, you know, it, it kind of felt like, like kind of tending dying embers or something. So I would always go to the meetings and just to see, you know, and to kind of feel sorry <laughs> that it was all over and mourn maybe in some kind of way. And this guy started to come, this guy from Step, and he was crazy looking and he would sit in the back and he would <laughs> tap his foot and sigh you know, people would say something like, we gotta, you know, we gotta get back out there and we gotta change the system from inside the system. And this guy would be like, <sighs> he was just kind of back there groaning. How did and I look? felt like groaning. How did he and that look? was interesting. Why did he look crazy to you? He's this crazy hair, you know, I mean, it was kind of, you know, I mean, they're dreadlocks. Now I know what they are, but I didn't know. I didn't know what they are. Nobody had hair like that. I didn't know. Isn't what it everyone was. in the movement have dreadlocks? Yeah, they do. But I didn't know. I didn't know what it was. You know, I thought it was like crazy homeless black man hair. I don't know what it was. You know, <laughs> we didn't have that in the south. You know, I mean, I don't know. We didn't have that. And he was beautiful. He was brown and smooth, and had a beard, and was impatient and angry and beautiful. 
quiet too in a certain kind of way aside from all the groaning and moaning and sighing and being pissed off. Did and you have just, a crush on him? I don't know what I thought of him. I thought he was, I thought he was not like other people. And he said that he wasn't like other people. And he said, uh, he said that he had a, he was part of a group called STEP. And so I was like, well, what does STEP stand for? Because you know, everything stands for something. You know, there's always an acronym, right? And he was like, it doesn't stand for anything. And I was like, well, you can't just be STEP. What does that mean, STEP? And he said, no, it's just like, it's just STEP. And I was like, toward something? And he was like, I mean, if you want it to, sure. I don't know. Anyway, they have this house. They lived in this house and... How many is there? Uh, well now, when I met him, there were, there were only five of them. There had been more. A lot got arrested. Some died in jail and that kind of thing. Um, so when I got to the house, there were just five. But now we're, now we're 13 in the house. Kids too. It's kind of a, the cops call it a compound, but I think that's a, what's that word? Uh, pejorative term. It's just a place where we live. And we have to watch out for ourselves because the people in the neighborhood don't like how we are or what we do. You know, we don't, we don't, we don't eat meat and we don't believe in going to the grocery store and eating Purdue chickens or whatever shit people eat. So we grow stuff and we have a garden. And you know, if you have a garden, you have to fertilize stuff, which everybody knows. So you can use your scraps and stuff for fertilizer. And it's kind of smelly, but I mean, whatever. So we have a compound because what about? we need to keep ourselves safe and we need a place to grow our vegetables and a place to be. Don't you so. protest in the middle of the night occasionally with a bullhorn telling people in the neighborhood what you think of them? It's not protest. You know, I'm going to tell you about that neighborhood. The thing about that neighborhood is it's great. People think that we don't understand. We understand that there's a black middle class and that there needs to be a black middle class and that the black middle class needs to be strong. But the problem is that people are unhappy and they're not actually strong at all. These people are subject to everything. Even, I'll give you an example. The people in the neighborhood don't like us. So they go to the cops and they say, we don't like those step people because there's garbage smells. What do you think the cops do? Nothing because they don't care about the black people in the neighborhood complaining about some garbage. And they don't care about whatever pet, they don't care. So these people are pretending that they have some power because they have big TVs or a Buick or whatever, but they don't actually have anything. So we're just trying to remind them that they don't actually have anything. Is that, is that where you're situated in this neighborhood particularly? Well, at first it was okay. I mean, at first they didn't mind so much, but I think then they didn't really. And we said we were going to grow tomatoes and stuff, but, and we used to sell stuff, you know. We used to have a little cart. We would go around with, with produce and stuff that we grew, but I guess they're city people, so they didn't really realize that you have to have fertilizer to make stuff grow, and then it doesn't smell like roses. So then they got mad. And I guess I get it, right? I mean, I understand. We're not stupid. Property values, all that kind How of stuff. How long have you been there? This house, well, they were there before I got there. This house now, three years. And when did you become barber? Hmm. I don't know if I can say a moment. They gave me that name. It's a name they gave me. And how long have you had the name? A year and a half or so, I guess. And you're becoming more and more of yourself? Is that how you feel? Yeah, because it's like I said, I thought I wanted to be alone and not belong to anything or be any part of anything. I thought I wanted to be alone, but really I wanted to be in love. And I'm in love with these people. And I'm in love with the way we live. We're ourselves. You know, we're going to have to be stopping rather soon here. Our session is nearly up. Yeah. But I'm glad that you're starting to feel more like yourself. 
Hmm. Yeah. More like the self, I think, that was always a part of you. Yeah, I suppose so. I suppose it was always here. I mean, the thing is, when you grow up in a way that you live in a little town like Absalom, and you're always on the outside of everything, the outside actually is your inside, right? Like, it's where you're supposed to be. That's right. And I think we step are on the outside, but it's where we're supposed to be. Well, now you're on the inside, don't you think? I mean, I we're all so. strangers to ourselves, don't you think? I suppose so. And I don't feel like a stranger to myself anymore. Well, I'm glad. You're Barbara in my eyes. And now, our session is over. Mm.